Good evening to everybody. My name is Melanie Sosa, and I'm the secretary of the APGYP Peru chapter. Um, first of all, I would like to welcome all the audience um, from Peru uh, and other countries of America, North, North America, Europe, and so on. Not only on behalf of our association, but also of the AP, AAP Peru student chapters from Tacna, Arequipa, Cusco, Piura, and the San Marcos and UNI universities from Lima, Peru. All of them have organized this webinar with us. Additionally, I want to thank you also to Atentamente Peru, who is collaborating with us with their streaming platform to provide the best experience in our webinars. Thank you so much to you, to all of you. The Young Professional Chapter of the America Association of Petroleum Geology of Peru is a group to aims to promote and disseminate geoscientific knowledge to the students and young professionals in the energy industry. As, pa as part of the goal set for this year, the chapter will organize a series of course, talks, webinars, and so on, in order to promote research through continuous training. In this opportunity, we have the great satisfaction and pride of having one of the leaders in soil tectonic and a study of soil. Thank you, Mike Hudek, for accepting our invitation to participate in this webinar, and we really appreciate that. Um, okay. Thank you very much. I look forward to being here. Oh, thank you. Mike is a senior research scientist at the Bureau of Economic Geology and directs the Applied Geodynamics Laboratory, or AGL, an industry-sponsored research consortium studying the soil tectonics. He received his PhD from the University of Wyoming in 1990 and spent the next eight years at Exxon Production Research, where he specialized in soil tectonics, stational tectonics, and seismic interpretation. His current research interests include palimpsestic restoration of the soil structure, deep water structural styles, and evolution of the Gulf of Mexico basin. Today, we'll share with us the. Today, we will share with us the webinar, the title "Contractional Soil Tectonic Systems," and here you have a brief summary of the webinar. Contractional soil tectonic systems occur at the down deep ends of the passive margin and continentally collision zones and in inverted basin. However, salt-related contractional structural styles have many similarities regardless of, of tectonic settings. Salt is mechanically weak so form a preferred detachment levels in both stational and contractional settings. Thus, many fault belts are detached on salt or have multiple detachments if there is more than one salt layer. Many trusts carry salt in their hugging walls, creating a complex network of salt sheds. However, the real com complexities in contractional soil tectonic systems come if there were a diapirs in the area before shortening began. Pre-existing diapirs shorten before the surrounding country rocks and, and serve as a nucleation points for the truss faults. Truss faults lie up between the appears substantially modifying the map pattern of the truss. Salt, salt sheets may be struck from the appear crest during, the sh during shortening, creating even more complexity. Thus, they, they are, there are several different styles on contractional salt tectonic systems, depending on the existence and geometry of pre-existence the appears. This can lead to confusion and in the identification and interpretation of the salt involved fall and trust belt. Well, just to remark something before this presentation, the presentation is going to take 45, 
45 minutes approximately. At the end of the presentation, you will have the opportunity to write down your question on the Zoom chat. Uh, so, don't, so do not hesitate to ask anything. Please, I encourage you to keep your microphone and camera off during the presentation so as not interrupt the exhibitor, Mike. So, Mike, welcome again, and we are ready whenever you want. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm looking forward to the opportunity to talk to this group. So, um, contractional salt tectonic styles. Um, as uh, you heard during the abstract, um, in sometimes salt tectonic styles with compression look just like salt tectonics, well, just look like compressional styles without. Um, you know, you, you look at a fold belt and it looks just the same whether there's salt in it or not. But there are other times when the salt makes a very, very big difference. And you can get some things that aren't even recognized as compressional belts sometimes that uh, occurred in the middle of contractional provinces. So I'm going to be talking about what um, salt tectonic styles look like in compressional fold belts and uh, talk a little bit about why some of them look some ways and why other ones look different. Now, the big thing to remember whenever you're dealing with salt is that salt uh, is weaker than just about any other geologic material. So if this plot, it's a graph, so don't be too scared. But the dashed lines in the middle show the strength of salt in both tension on the left-hand side and compression on the right. And you can see that the strength of salt is almost zero uh, in both tension and compression. And it is much, much weaker than any kind of shale or limestone or sandstone or anything else. The only time salt can be stronger is in the very shallow subsurface, okay? Um, if you're in the top 500 meters or so, you may end up having salt that is stronger than some of the materials around it. But once you get any kind of burial depth, salt is much, much weaker than any other material that's around. And that is, turns out to be the, the key to understanding salt tectonics. Um, if, if you remember that salt is weaker than whatever is around it in most situations, you're going to understand most of what goes on in salt tectonics. So. Now, where do we see compressional fold belts uh, that are detached on salt? Uh, you see it in three main settings, and they're shown here in this uh, figure. Uh, the first one is at the down dip toe uh, in A of a passive margin. So if you have extension at the up dip part of the passive margin, everything slides downhill into deep water, and down at the down dip end of the basin, you have a fold belt. Uh, the best known ones are in the northern Gulf of Mexico, the Perdido fold belt, the Atwater fold and thrust belt. You actually have thrust belts like this or fold belts like this at the down dip end of almost all um, salt involved passive margins. So they're very common. And uh, in the last two decades, there have been a number of very significant discoveries made in those. Uh, next one uh, down B below is in orogenic belts where you have basement involved thrusting coming up into a salt basin, which is shown on the left hand side of the diagram. What usually happens is that the thrust comes up into the salt and then because the salt is so weak, it detaches on the salt and starts sliding out on the salt. And then you have a whole series of thrust faults that are detached on the salt layer. Uh, the most famous and most productive one of those in the world is uh, the Zagros fold belt in Iran. Actually, the Zagros is the most uh, hydrocarbon prolific fold and thrust belt of any kind in the world by a lot. Uh, and it's detached on salt. You also have some good South American examples. Um, thrust belts are, are, that are involved in orogenic systems just happen wherever there is a pre-existing salt basin that happens to get caught in a plate tectonic collision. And then the last one down in C at the bottom is inversion. When you have any kind of a rift basin with salt in it that gets inverted, you have compressional styles. So all three of those uh, are ways in which you can get shortening. And which one you see depends on what basins you're working on. So I'm going to start out with the simplest kind of uh, salt involved compressional styles, which are the ones without precursor structures. Now, what's a precursor structure? <laughs> 
Um, a precursor structure in salt tectonics is a, is a diapere that was there before the shortening started. Uh, what you're going to see is that when there are diapeers that are there before the shortening started, everything changes and you get some very, very complicated styles. But to begin with, we're going to say that before the shortening started, there were no precursor structures. Everything was flat lying, homogeneous. There was nothing exciting going on before the shortening started. So what kind of structures do you see in this kind of setting? Well, the simplest kind that you get are buckle folds. Uh, these are salt cord folds. And there's a series of one, two, three of these down at the bottom of this figure. You can ignore the, the red salt over the top for the moment. And uh, what happens in these folds is that the beds fold over the top and then salt flows from the edges into the middle. So the middle inflates and so you get this big thick pile of salt in the middle of the anticline and underneath the synclines there's often no salt at all because the salt has moved from the synclines into the anticline. So salt is flowing um, and because it's so weak it can actually flow. Technically in most geologic settings, salt is considered a fluid, which means it has no strength and can flow. So salt flows out from underneath the synclines and into the anticlines on all the sides, and that's what helps the folds to grow. And whenever you're in a basin where there is uh, shortening going on, usually the first structures that get drilled are uh, the salt cord anticlines. And the ones that are labeled here at the top, Mad Dog and K2 Timon, uh, those are both major oil fields in the northern Gulf of Mexico. They drilled just right on top of the anticline and made big discoveries. <clears throat> Here's another example of some salt cord folds in the compressional fold belt. This is also from the northern Gulf of Mexico. Um, this is in the Perdido fold belt, which is in the far western Gulf of Mexico, a little bit in the United States, and then most of it's in Mexico. And you see some of the, the really diagnostic features of these kind of compressional folds. What you see is shown in the arrow here, there is an early group of sediments that maintain constant thickness across the whole area. There's no change in isopack or no significant change in isopack. So it's uniform thickness, which means it is what we call pre-kinematic, which means it was deposited before, um, before the shortening began. So all of these sort of blue units in the dark green were deposited before the shortening happened when everything was just flat line. And then on the top of that, in the lighter green and the orange, you see that the units are dramatically thinning over the folds. And the reason we often see this kind of style of a pre-kinematic layer that's constant thickness and then a synkinematic layer over the top of it is that uh, shortening events are usually fairly short compared with the overall history of a basin. So what that means is that the basin goes on for a long time with nothing happens and then there's a really brief time when there's a lot of excitement and a lot of shortening and then you go back into not much happening again. So this fact that shortening events are fairly short and dramatic means that we often have these um, constant thickness roofs within a very abrupt unconformity over the top of them. And that's actually something that is diagnostic of shortening. When you see a constant thickness roof overlain by a, a much more interesting um, stratigraphic package, that usually means that shortening has happened. Okay, so here's another example of the same kind of thing. Um, this is from the Beta Cordillera in Spain. Um, and you see again the same sort of thing. You see that these lower units are all constant thickness. There's no thinning across the anticlines. So then the folding happened and it's the later units that have all of the exciting isopack variations. Uh, in this case, this shows a couple of examples. There's a fairly upright fold here, which is sometimes called a box fold. And then you also see that sometimes if there's been a lot of shortening, you see a thrust fault which has offset uh, one or both limbs of the anticline. So this is something that started as an anticline and is now developing a thrust fault. All right, so one question people sometimes have is, well, how does a fold like this form? And in particular, what role does the salt play in the formation of these folds? And this is a finite element model, a computer simulation of a compressional fold. And all of these thin units over the top, those are beds, okay? 
and then this clear unit down at the bottom, that's the salt. And what you see is you, this model has been shortened. So you see that we're making a fold in here. And what you can see then, the colors here are pressure. And what's interesting is that the pressure in the center of the fold here is actually low. The dark green is a low pressure region, which means this is not the case that the salt is forcing its way up and lifting up the beds. If the salt was forcing the beds up, the pressure in the salt in here would be very high. Instead, the pressure is low, which means that what's happening is that the, the fold is forming and that the center is going up and that the salt is actually being sucked into the core. All right, the, the core is, the salt is not what's forcing the anticline to rise. The anticline is rising and then the salt is being sucked in. Now in the lower diagram, we see the same fold at a later time when you've continued so shortening so that the sides of the fold have come in and pinched shut. And then you have a little tiny piece of salt that's still left up in here. Most of the salt that used to be in the core actually got pumped back down into the source layer. But once you have the fold pinched shut like this, the salt that is now in the core is trapped and now you can start pressurizing the salt in there. So the salt in the core of the fold does not become high pressure until, until a very late time in the development of the fold. Uh, we see a seismic example of a fold like this. This is from the Campos Basin in Brazil. Uh, here is the anticline. You can see it in the beds and it has pinched shut. And there is just a tiny little piece of salt that was trapped in here. And it's interpreted to be squirting up. It's been rising up. It actually broke through some of the overlying rock units in the interpretation here. So this is one of those folds that used to be a broad open fold but you kept shortening it and then the two limbs pinched together and the salt is just a tiny little thin skim that's left in here. Most of the salt that was here has actually pumped back down into the source layer. Okay, so those are folds, <clears throat> salt cord folds. That's the simplest kind of compressional structure that you see in a salt basin when you shorten it. Now next are thrust faults. Okay, where do we see thrust faults? Well, you see them in a couple of settings most commonly. Uh, one is at the down dip end in A at the top of the slide, at the down dip end of a salt sheet. And a salt sheet is kind of like a mini passive margin where there is extension at the up dip end of the salt sheet and the salt and everything is moving seaward and there is shortening at the down dip end, okay? Then you see a much larger scale example on a real passive margin where you have on, in B, uh, up dip extension going down and you get big thrust systems at the down dip end. And then finally, the one I mentioned before in orogenic systems, where you have some kind of a big basement thrust back here, and then the shortening comes up the basement thrust and a bunch of shortening comes out along the salt layer because it's so weak. And you get a bunch of thrusts that are detached on the salt layer, a bunch back here, and then a big one in the front. Now this particular cross section is schematic, but it's actually based on the salt range in Pakistan, which is, is the main Himalayan central thrust here. These are the Himalaya mountains back to the left. And this is the Potwar Plateau. Okay, and this, this mountain range in the front is called the salt range. So this is actually based on a real example in this case. Okay, so what does it look like when you have thrust faults that are detached on salt. And it turns out that what it looks like depends on where exactly the salt, the detachment layer is in the salt. If the detachment is at the top of the salt layer and is running right along the top of the salt layer, well, you just thrust the sediments over each other, okay? But if the detachment is either halfway down in the salt layer or else at the base of the salt layer, when you do the thrusting, you actually take a sliver of salt and carry it along. So in this type of situation, the salt is actually carried in the thrust fault. Now I would say in all the natural examples that I've seen, I have very rarely seen A, okay? Almost always the detachment is either partway down in the salt layer or is closer to the base of the salt layer. So that when you have thrusting in a salt basin, you are typically carrying a big slab of salt along with the thrust. 
And so, for example, if you were drilling through here, you would go through the salt and then back out of the salt and then into the salt the second time. You actually start stacking the salt layers when you um, have a detachment that's deep in the salt layer. And that is the most common. Uh, you can see that in this area in here, which is in the Rodanian Basin in France. It's part of the French Alps. Um, and you can see the salt, which is red again. Uh, there's the detachment layer is on the salt and you have a whole series of thrust faults that come up that are detached on the salt and they carry salt in their hanging walls. And then, for example, in this one, you can see that the salt is actually exposed at the surface. And that's true in a lot of mountain ranges. You see that in the Pyrenees, you see that in the Alps, you see that in the Himalayas. Uh, in most places where you have thrust faults that are detached on salt, um, they are carrying salt in their hanging walls and in many cases bring them all the way up to the surface. Okay, so we've talked about folding, we've talked about thrusting, uh, and we're going to continue talking about thrusting a little bit here and look at some examples at the down dip ends of salt sheets. All right, so this is a, a salt sheet in the Gulf of Mexico called the Sigsby Canopy and it is advancing seaward and so the salt again is this red stuff. And there are actually a bunch of wells drilled in here. This big anticline that you're seeing at the very bottom of the section is actually an oil field. This is Mad Dog Field. Um, and so there have been a bunch of wells that have drilled through here and come all the way down into the anticline. So we know the ages of the stratigraphy. And you can see here that this, which is um, lowermost quaternary, this dark green is here, and then it's also down here. Now, if you look at the scale, that's two kilometers. So this, is, this thrust on a salt sheet has actually gone about six kilometers sideways and looking at the vertical scale about three kilometers up. So this is a very, very large structure because this point right here at the very top of the light green used to be down there. This used to be in contact. So you can get fairly big thrust systems. Now you also note that I've drawn something that you can't see very well, that there's a little bit of an imbricate thrust belt out in front of the salt sheet. Uh, in the next slide, we're gonna zoom a little bit and look at some examples of these kind of imbricate wedges at the fronts of salt sheets. In the top, you can see some very, very nice thrusting. Again, it's coming in and is being pushed by the thrust system. And at the bottom, you get a much more complicated system with actually there's this dark green down here is a very, complicated imbricate thrust belt. There's actually another one here. And then up in the blue, you see there's some more widely spaced thrusts. So shortening at the tips of these kind of thrust systems are actually quite common, these kind of salt sheets. Now, what can make things more complicated? Well, things start getting much more complicated if there are multiple salt layers. And here's an example. These are drawn from physical models. Um, the red down here is a salt layer. The pink that's higher up is another salt layer. And what you see is that you get independent sets of structures above both salt layers. So in some cases, you get an anticline in the higher area above an anticline in the lower area. Um, but it, over here, you've got a syncline that's over an anticline. All right, so that's complicated. And down in the lower one, you can see here's a syncline that's over flat. Um, this is an anticline off to the side of an anticline. It just gets all complicated. So when you have multiple salt layers, uh, the mapping gets very difficult because your structures can change completely when you cross a salt layer. The stuff up here has nothing to do with the stuff down there. And this is actually the case in parts of the Zagros fold belt where they mapped the surface geology this is back in the 1920s and 1930s when they were doing a lot of the exploration out here. And they drilled all the surface anticlines. And they were very confused because they drilled down and sometimes they would hit a trap at depth. And other times um, they drill the anticline and they'd come in off the crest of the underlying structure. And it wasn't for a long time that they started realizing that the traps, which are down here in the blue sequence, could not be reliably predicted from the shallow structures because there were multiple detachment levels. So if there, you have multiple thick salt levels, things can get quite complicated very quickly. The other question to ask is, uh, what about basement faults, basement shortening? 
So in all of these, this gray down at the bottom is the basement, the red is the salt, and then the blue units over the top are the sediments over the top of the salt. And you can get a couple of different styles with basement faulting. In some cases, what you see is that the thrust faults cut all the way through the salt, all the way through the sediment, and it's just all one big fault going all the way through. And that is called a fully coupled system, where the structures above the salt are the same as the structures below the salt. There's no difference. Then you get up what's called a, well, I'll go down to the bottom, a decoupled system, where you have shortening. Let's say there's one kilometer of shortening down here. There is one kilometer of shortening in the cover, but it's completely unrelated to where the shortening is in the basement. Okay, I mean, it's off to the side. This could be many kilometers away, tens of kilometers away. So they're completely unrelated. That's decoupled. And then you get probably the most common one, which is partially coupled, where the fault does not continue all the way through. These are not the same structures. There's a different thrust fault above the salt than there is below the salt, but they are spatially associated. All right, they're, they're close to each other and they'll often have the same trends and, and be kind of systematically associated with each other. So again, when you have a salt layer, the geology of the stuff that's above the salt is not necessarily a clear guide to the geology of what's below the salt. Okay, so all of these have been with no precursor structures. The bedding before the shortening started was uh, completely flat lying. There were no salt domes, there were no salt walls, no interesting salt structures were there before the shortening started. Well, it turns out there are a lot of basins in the world where there were diapirs before shortening. And so once you have diapirs in a system, it turns out that everything starts getting a lot more complicated. And that's kind of shown in this diagram. So the top two images are shortening with no precursor structures. So you can see before the shortening starts, there's nothing. There's just flat beds. And then you start shortening and you get some of the structures we've talked about. You get a salt cord fold. Uh, a, this is a more tightly deformed salt cord fold. And you get thrust faults. Okay, Th these are the types of structures we've been talking to up till now. Well, then we go and let's say that there were diapirs there before the shortening started. So here we got one, two, three different diapirs, and then the shortening starts. Now remember that I said that salt is the, usually the weakest unit in geology. And so if you take this basin with the diapirs and shorten it, you're going to say, well, what's going to deform first? Well, and so there is uh, an experiment that you can do at home to try to solve this for yourself. If you take a series of wooden boards and lay them out in your apartment or your house on the floor and uh, near a wall, okay, so just lay them near a wall and then put little gaps between the boards so there's air between the boards. And then what you're going to do is fill the gaps with marshmallow or something very soft, some other thing that's very soft. And then you get at the edge of the boards and you start pushing them against the wall, pushing the whole assemblage of the boards and the spaces toward the wall. And you say, well, what's going to deform first? Is it going to be the boards? Are you going to see the boards start thrusting and deforming internally? Or is it going to be the soft stuff in between, the marshmallows? Well, it's going to be the marshmallows because they're the weakest, okay? The boards are strong and uh, marshmallows are weak. Well, the same is true with salt. So whenever you have a basin that's got salt structures in it, those are the weakest things. And so if you push this from the end, the salt diapirs are going to shorten first. That you're not gonna touch these sediments. They're not going to do anything, okay? It's all going to be in the salt. And so after the shortening, you see down here at the bottom, this diapir here in the middle has shortened to become kind of a teardrop. Okay, it's squeezed completely shut. Um, this one, which is more slanted, squeezed completely shut and then it thrusted. And then this one over here inverted. So this starts introducing the concept that I'm going to be talking about for most of the rest of the talk, which is that when you have pre-existing salt structures, those salt structures will control most of the deformation. Okay, they, that's where the deformation is going to start, is where the salt structures are. So let's say we have a diapir, which is the one shown in red here. What happens when you shorten it? 
Well, when you shorten, the walls move closer together, okay? So the salt that was here, the two walls are moving together. Something has to happen to the salt that was in the middle. Okay, so where does it go? Well, in theory, some of it could go down if there was space for it to go down into. If there was a salt layer, it could inject into, but mostly it will go up. And so what happens when you start shortening a diapir is you start arching the roof of the diapir. Now notice that this is kind of similar to what we were talking about earlier with the compressional folds in that we had a constant thickness roof over the top that was laid down at a time when the diapir was not growing, it was dead. But then you start shortening and you arch that constant thickness roof, make an anticline, and you can see the stratigraphy start to onlap over the crest of that fold. So this is sort of like uh, one of these compressional anticlines just with a diapir in the middle of it. So one of the things you look for with shortening of a diapir is first thing that happens is you start making an anticline over the roof. Okay. So the sequence of things that happens are sort of shown in this series of uh, illustrations here. So the top is first. You have a diapir, it's dead. You're depositing a roof over the top of it. And then what's going to happen if you look along the right side here is we're going to start moving the right side in and we're going to start squeezing this diapir. And what's gonna happen of course is because the sediments are very strong and the diapir is very weak is that the sediments are not going to deform but the diapir is going to deform. So what happens is the diapir starts getting narrower and it's going to keep, the walls are gonna keep coming together until the narrowest part of the diapir touches. So it's still open here, it's narrower down here, and then here we finally have a weld. A weld is where the two, um, two pieces of, of rock that were separated by salt actually start touching. All right, so we've come and had a weld. Now the salt that was in here, in say up here, the salt that was in here went up, okay? So the salt that was in here that got squirted out now is all the way up here. And you have something that's sometimes called a balloon on a string. So this is the balloon up here, the salt, and then the weld is the string that's connecting down. So this is an example of what happens to a diapir. You start with an anticline, and then it gets taller and taller and taller until it finally pinches shut, okay? Uh, here's a seismic example of this type of structure. Uh, the blue up here, this is from uh, Deepwater Gabon, that's the top of salt. And so the diapir, the blue is up here and then you can see the diapir comes down here and then comes back up. And here is the weld in here. You can see the beds on both sides are touching. And so here's the balloon and there's the string. So this is a diapir that has been completely pinched shut in shortening. Uh, here's an example of several diapirs. And in this case, these diapirs didn't just pinch shut, they actually thrusted. So, the, so if you look at the diapir with the green thrust fault in here, the top part of the diapir is up here. The bottom part of the diapir is down here. And you have essentially squeezed the diapir shut and then cut a thrust fault through so that the top part is separated from the bottom part. The top part of the diapir has been thrusted away from the bottom. You see the same thing actually on all four of the thrusts that are shown here, starting at the left, the purple one, there's the top part of the diapir and the bottom. Then over here, top part of the diapir and the bottom. And then the last one, you see the top part of the diapir and you go off the end of the line before you see the bottom part. Okay, so once again, this is another squeezed diapir geometry, uh, a little bit more extreme. You didn't just pinch the diapir shut, you actually thrusted the top part away from the bottom part. So up to now, we've been looking at cross section. So what happens in map view when you uh, shorten a diapir? And that's what we're gonna look at in here. Let's look at the left-hand diagram. The red is the pre-existing diapir. Okay, now the pre-existing diapir originally, the black dashed line shows where the right edge of it was before you started shortening. So it used to be wider than it is now. With the shortening, let's say there has been one kilometer of shortening. So the edge has moved from here and it's moved one kilometer towards the center. So the diapir is one kilometer narrower than it used to be. 
Well, now what happens is that the same one kilometer of shortening has to exist to the north and has to exist to the south, but there are no diapirs to the north and south. So you're going to have to take that shortening up in the rocks. So in here you have thrust faults. So where the diapir is, there's really no thrust, but a long strike, you do have thrusts. So you have a thrust fault that comes in and then it's a diapir and then a thrust fault that comes out the other side. So what the system looks like depends on where you are. If, you're in a, if you happen to be looking at a cross section where there were no diapirs, it's just going to look like thrust faults. However, if you're in here, your cross section goes through here, um, you're not even gonna see a thrust fault most of the time. You're just gonna see a diapir that's maybe narrower than it used to be. Also, because the diapirs are the weakest parts of the system, the thrust faults around here start at the diapirs and come out. So this thrust fault, if you look at a, a physical modeling experiment, the thrust starts here and then propagates out. And this thrust fault starts here and propagates out. So the thrust faults all connect to the diapirs because the diapirs control where the thrust faults started. So this is at an early stage on the left. On the right, we show a much later stage where the diapir is even narrower. You can see the original black dashed outline. Now the diapir is getting close to pinching shut. And you can see that there's a lot more shortening along strike. And again, all of the thrust faults connect in to the diapir. Okay. So now to, to make these uh, a little more clear, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some 3D block diagrams. And I point out this is from a paper that was published from our group. This is Oliver Duffy is the um, senior author. And so it was Ollie who drew um, these lines. So what we've got is a situation where we have a series of pre-existing diapirs, okay, that you can see. And they aren't really connected up. And we're going to show some experiments, some mental experiments, where we have this thin layer, this darker green unit on the bottom. We're not going to show you what happens with the darker unit. Now, this kind of situation is what we call an isolated diapir province, in that the stocks and walls are not connected. They're completely separated. They're by themselves. They are isolated. And there's sediments in between them. Okay. So we're gonna see what happens when we shorten an isolated diapir province. So early on, so you see the light green layer, which is the roof over the top. Early on, what happens? You can see this back area has been moving, so the shortening is coming from the right-hand side. So what happens? Well, out in the front, where the shortening has not really become very big yet, all that we're doing is arching the diapirs. Okay, so we're just making those anticlines that are over the top because we're in fairly mild shortening here. Now further back, this diapir is closer to where the shortening is coming from. And what we're seeing here is that we have pinched this diapir completely shut. And the salt that was here, some of it went back down into the source layer, but most of it went up. And in fact, most of it broke through and came out and made a salt sheet that is flowing out over the surface. And that's something that we see very commonly in shortening is that a lot of the world's salt sheets are in place during shortening events. So this one has come out and spit out a salt sheet. And then this one back here, um, this has also broken through the roof and it is kicking out several salt sheets. Now there was a diapir over here. In this case, we're just arching the roof, but you can see that thrust faults are starting to connect from this salt structure over to that one. They haven't quite connected yet, but they will. And you can see there's a thrust fault that's thinking about connecting over like that as well. So again, remember that when you have pre-existing diapirs, the thrusts do not look like thrusts that you're used to seeing in just a regular fold and thrust belt where all the thrusts are parallel to each other and they're regularly spaced and they're simple. Uh, the thrust geometries get much more complicated because they are trying to connect up the salt diapirs. Here is the same thing at a later stage. So we've done even more shortening in here. All of the diapirs are now kicking out salt sheets out the top. They are all welding. Uh, this one here, 
This was welded in the previous diagram. It's now been thrust so that the top part of the diapir has been moved away from the bottom part of the diapir. And that's a geometry I showed you from Gabon. And the salt sheets are being kicked out. The salt sheet from this diapir and the salt sheet from that diapir are now actually coming together and suturing. And you can see the thrust faults. The, these thrusts all come in and they connect to this diapir. There's a complicated network of thrust faults connecting this diapir to that diapir. And you can see that the geometries, these are not long straight thrust faults at all. They're very curved uh, and they sort of have mysterious geometries. If you don't recognize that you're connecting up diapirs, this will look very weird to you. Okay, <clears throat> so where do we see isolated diapir provinces. Well, the, the best known one is in, again, the Zagros fold belt. <clears throat> so what this is, is a satellite image that has been draped over um, a DEM, topography, <clears throat> okay? So we have in the brown here, these, these are the uh, limestones. This is a big uh, compressional anticline. Uh, here's another compressional anticline to the left and another one up at the top of the picture. And the stuff that is black here is salt coming out at the surface. Now what's happening in, the, if we look at this left one, this area here that's labeled the summit dome, that is the diapir that is coming up. Now it's being squeezed, so salt is being pumped up, okay? So it's coming up here and then it's actually flowing out over the surface. This is a salt sheet that is flowing out into the valley. Over here, here's another diapir here that's flowing out into the valley. And there's another diapir here, which has not flowed out into the valley. But notice that um, the anticlines are connecting up the diapirs. So for example, the left-hand one, there's a diapir here. There's actually another diapir here. And so the anticline is actually zigzagging a little bit. It's taking a little bit of a bend to try to connect up the diapirs. And then there is another anticline here. And then because this one is not really a long trend, it's got its own anticline and we're starting to have a little bit of a relay developed in here. So this is shortening at a fairly early stage. We have not made thrust faults yet. We're still just folding, okay? But you can see that all of the diapirs are right along the crests of the anticline and that's because the diapirs were there first and they localized where the shortening happened, where the anticlines are. Okay. Uh, so that was isolated diapirs. Now let's talk about isolated mini basins. So the idea here is that in this case, the sediment mini basins are by themselves and there is this continual network of salt that is separating them. So in the last case, the diapirs were by themselves. In this case, the mini basins between the diapirs are by themselves and all the salt is completely connected up. So if you imagine shortening this, well, the salt's going to shorten first. So in the beginning, nothing's going to happen to these mini basins. And that's what we actually see. This is a paper, another paper by Ollie Duffy that's actually in review. Uh, you can look at it on Earth Archive. There's a preprint of it. So in this case, in the early shortening, all that's happening is that the salt walls that were separating all the mini basins are pinching shut. So now over here, these two mini basins have come into contact. These two mini basins are starting to come into contact. These two are in contact. But further out where the shortening is not as extreme, the mini basins are still not in contact. Getting, all that's happening is that the salt walls are getting narrower. So inside these mini basins, there's actually no shortening yet. All that's happening is that the walls are getting narrower. Then later on, once the, once the mini basins are all starting to touch against each other, then they can start to thrust over each other. So in this case, um, nothing happens for a fairly long time. And then finally, once all the salt has been squirted out, then you can finally start to get some shortening that you could recognize. So where do we see this? The best known area is the Sebus Basin in Turkey. This is a map. Um, we're in the middle of the, a big orogenic belt in here. 
to read this map, which is a big mess, the, the dark gray and the black is the salt. At the surface, it's mostly gypsum, but it's, it's the salt layer. And then, for example, you see here one mini basin that's labeled Karayun. Um, it's actually turned up, it's almost dipping vertically in places in here. So there's a mini basin. You can see it's come in contact with the mini basin next to it. There's another mini basin up here. There's another mini basin over here that's Emiran. Uh, Ilkindi is over here. And so all these mini basins have been basically shoved together as the salt that was in between them has been displaced. So there's actually very little deformation inside the mini basins. Almost all of the deformation was taken up in the salt that surrounded all of them. And for about 50 years, nobody recognized this as a shortened mini basin province. Everybody kept trying to interpret it as a regular thrust belt and everybody kept having a hard time because it doesn't make any sense as a thrust belt. Um, so it was a long time before anybody actually figured it out. Okay, so <clears throat> what can we say? Well, we've talked about three main types of compressional salt systems. In the first one, which is shown at the top, you, um, you don't have any precursor structures and the salt acts as a detachment layer to thrust faults and in places you also get compressional folds. It's the simplest, it's the easiest, um, and there are quite a few of these in the world. Probably even more common in the world, though, are the two that are shown at the bottom. Uh, in the upper left, you have the isolated diapir provinces in which uh, a series of pre-existing diapirs all shorten and then the thrust faults try to connect everything up. And the isolated mini basin provinces, okay, where you have um, lots of salt separating all the sediment depot centers and all that salt has to squirt out first before you can really even start the deformation. Okay, so if you're seeing the one on top, chances are this looks like thrust belts you saw in school, you will recognize it immediately. If you happen to be working in either of these two on the bottom, you may have a lot more difficulty figuring out what's going on because it doesn't obey any of the rules you're used to thinking of for fold and thrust belts. Because the salt is so weak, because the pre-existing diapirs are weak, it gives you a completely different structural style. Okay, so this has a, been a brief overview of contractional salt styles. Um, I hope that uh, you recognized at least some of the types of structures that you're seeing, and I'll be happy to take any questions at this point. Okay, thank you, Michael, for your great and detailed presentation. It was a really valuable information shared with us tonight. Now, uh, we can start with a question block. Um, so the uh, I wanna read uh, the chat. So I'm looking at the chat. The Guiana Suriname Basin belongs to which of these three styles, please? <clears throat> um, the answer to that is that I've never worked the Guiana Suriname Basin, so I don't know, um, unfortunately. So a good question, but one that I can't answer. Oh, um, anyone have any question? Maybe can write in the Zoom chat. Uh, maybe we, we can wait a few minutes. No problem. <laughs> okay. Everybody's brains are full. So, um, uh, from Manas Suhu, say that was a really enlightening presentation, Mike. Thanks a lot. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, you'll notice that uh, a lot of the figure references were to a publication by Jackson and Hudeck. Um, we actually published in 2017 a textbook on salt tectonics. Uh, a lot of these figures came out of that textbook. So if it's something that you're thinking of pursuing or are interested in, 
uh, that's not a bad place to start. Uh, if is to get it's called uh, salt tectonics principles and practice uh, Cambridge University Press by Martin Jackson and Mike Hudak so okay. Uh, okay so what about a presentation on extensional salt basins and structures well I could certainly give one <laughs> um, but uh, I don't think we have another 40 minutes just at this moment so Martin Oviedo and Carlos Marquez say that it was a excellent presentation. <laughs> well, I, I enjoyed the chance to give it. Um, I try. I check the Facebook. Maybe there there is another question. Maybe. Okay. Oh, uh, I, uh, uh, Carlos Quevedo says in Facebook that, that great seismic image from Lower Congo Basin. Um, to go back to that image? Mm -hmm. um, there great. Were, oh, just a great seismic image. Yeah, both of them. These are both Lower Congo Basin, this one and this one. Yeah, yeah. there. No, they're, they're very good. Interestingly, this is time seismic. Uh, the, I, this got cut off for some reason. And you get very good imaging through the salt in this case, mostly because the sediments at this depth are so fast that there is not a big velocity contrast with the salt. Um, so you're actually able to image on time data under the salt uh, with very little uh, artifacts. So it's a it, it's a happy situation. Most of the time when you have time data, um, it's not sufficient to see under the salt because you need to have depth processing. Um, oh, in Facebook, Stephanie Wisher say, in offshore basins, such as the Campos Basin, what would be, to, what would be the source for shortening? Um, in the offshore basin, in the Campos Basin, it is basically a giant gravity slide into deep water. Um, it's a combination of the tilt of the basement, the tilt of the base of salt, which is dipping seawards, um, the tilt of the topographic surface, which is deeper in deep water and shallow at the continent, and also the heavier sediment load that is placed closer to the shore, and usually the sediment pile thins the further you go outboard. So the combination of a dipping salt layer, a dipping topographic surface, and the, the sediment that's being piled up near the shoreline, they all are what's driving everything seaward. If you want to think of a passive margin as a giant landslide, that's kind of right. Um, that's pretty much the physics. So um, it's, it's all a gravity-driven system on a passive margin like the Campos or Santos basins. Um, we see, uh, well, whoops, I had one here. At, at the south of the Gulf of Mexico, we can see a variety of salt structures. What do you think about it? Wow, um, the southern Gulf, I was just looking at the southern Gulf of Mexico uh, with a company for four hours yesterday afternoon. Um, the southern Gulf of Mexico is a mess. Um, part of the reason for that is that it is a, a passive margin of the southern Gulf of Mexico, but it is close enough to Pacific plate tectonics that you're also getting orogenic shortening in there. So for example, um, the Bay of Campeche, the Salina del Istmo Basin, uh, has a tremendous amount of shortening. And in fact, most of the styles that I talked about here are things that you're going to be seeing in the Southern Gulf of Mexico. And in fact, if I go to the end, most of the Southern Gulf of Mexico is uh, an isolated diapir province. So you have all these salt sheets coming out over the top, squeezed diapirs down below, thrust faults running around, um, and things that go from being thrusted diapirs to just being a regular thrust fault to being a thrusted diapir. So actually, most of the, in the Bay of Campeche, the southern Gulf of Mexico, um, most of that is an isolated diapir province. Uh, it's, we got here, thanks for the presentation. Is there any evidence correlated with seismic lines or is it 
modeling for the last images and for the 3D blocks. Um, the three, these 3D blocks were just drawn from Ollie's brain, okay? But they are based on a lot of field observations from places like the Zagros, um, a lot of seismic data that we have, 3D seismic data from places like the Southern Gulf of Mexico or deep water West Africa or deep water Brazil. Um, so these particular images, uh, we, we designed this to try to show as many things in one block diagram as we could. But there is a, a fairly, it's based on a fairly extensive amount of uh, uh, knowledge uh, coming from real basins. So this isn't a real place, but it's based on a lot of real places. Um, so if any participant who attended have uh, any questions, this is the time. <laughs> but I think that Paul is very happy. All right, well. Thank you for the opportunity to present. I've really enjoyed myself. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Mike, um, from Michael Miranda, say, Mike, congratulations, it's a good presentation. Please, could you, to, could you talk about the difference between in the, within in, uh, the appears in sounds active in, and sounds passive exists the relation? Um, are you talking about passive diapirs and active diapirs? Yes. Okay. Please, could you talk about the difference between uh, the appears in some sounds active and sounds passive? Well, I'm not sure if I'm answering the question that he's talking about. Um, so a diapir that is growing at with its top at the surface is called a, a passive diapir because it's not actually piercing a roof, okay? Now imagine that this top green layer was not there. I don't really have a picture of a passive diapir in this presentation, but then this would be a passive diapir because it has no roof. An active diapir is a diapir that has a roof over the top and it is lifting up and arching its roof, okay? And shortening is a very common way for a diapir to become active. And in fact, uh, this previous illustration, this is a classic active diapir because it's arching and uplifting its roof. Now, I'm not sure that was the question he was trying to ask because I'm not sure what he means by zones active and zones passive. Um, mm, I think this is okay. Nope, he's mm -hmm. not clarifying, so that's going to have to do. Mm -hmm. Oh, don't worry. Um, well, if uh, you don't have any question, uh, I want to go into the, I'm going to pass to the last part of this webinar. And so there, Michael, thank you again for accepting the invitation of all the APG Peru chapters to participate in this webinar. And also we should thank you for sharing all your knowledge with us. Now we want to give you a certificate. Um, please let me share my screen. <laughs> All right, so I can stop sharing, I guess. screen. <laughs> no, um, uh, please. Um, uh, I hope you, you'll see the certificate. <laughs> Maybe. I do. I see the certificate. Thank you so much. Um, uh, you let me read uh, some, a little bit to the certificate. Go the ahead. certificate present to Michael Hudet in name of the AP Peru chapters of a word in recognition for sharing his knowledge and experience in contractional salt tectonic systems as a distinguished a speaker on September 24th, signed by Nereida, president of our chapter, and Vice President Leonardo. Uh, re we really appreciate you with your presentation. Well, it was my privilege. I really enjoyed the opportunity. <laughs>
Yeah, and maybe you have another uh, another uh, song word to say with to us. <laughs> well, um, salt based. Well, when I graduated from school, I had had exactly one one hour lecture on salt tectonics in four years of college, two years of master's, and three years of a PhD. So I almost knew nothing about salt tectonics. So uh, what I've found is that a lot of the rules that you learn in school about how geology behaves are actually different when you get into salt basins. A lot of them don't work. Um, and salt actually changes every aspect of a hydrocarbon system. It changes the structures, it changes stratigraphic deposition patterns, uh, source rock changes heat flow, everything is different. So if you never have to work in a salt basin, you're cool, you're, you're no problem. But if you ever have to work in one, um, I think you'll, you'll find that in the beginning, you will be completely panicked. You'll look at stuff and say, I don't understand anything that I'm seeing. But um, in a fairly short space of time, if you, you know, do some background reading and things, you can actually understand this. So don't give up is my, my word. That's, it is, you can figure it out. It just won't happen on the first day. So if you ever get assigned to a salt basin, you know, like the Southern Gulf of Mexico, anybody who comes straight out of school and works in the salt, Southern Gulf of Mexico, I feel very sorry for them because that's really hard salt geology. But with some patience and perseverance, you can understand this. So hang in there. Excellent. Uh, we are very happy. Um, uh, again, thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, I also este, um, I hope that this is not the last time we, we are uh, together with, in this lecture. Um, so thank you. Um, in addition, and many thanks to all those attending this presentation. Do not forget to follow in our social media networks like APE YP Peru in Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram platform to be informed about the next webinars. So thank you, Mike. Um, right. And again, um, the certificate I, we sent for email. All right. <laughs> so don't worry. Bye-bye, <laughs> everybody. So, Bye-bye.